especially to Jason for all the help uh, putting this together. Um, so this installation is in response really to coming home after a number of years being away. I began at a studio at Martial Arts and um, I was living in Los Angeles for a number of years and returned and suddenly um, not really anticipating that I was going to come back at the time. Um, I wanted to use materials from my parents' home, my childhood home where I grew up. And originally I thought this installation would have a lot of things, but in the end I just wanted to use these vases that my mother had begun collecting when I was little. And they were sort of in boxes or around. It was sort of this odd thing. And these vases, for those of you who remember, are um, they're sort of the, the most um, simple and uh, humble vase that you could have if you ordered someone an arrangement of flowers. This would be like a bug vase. And so people would toss these away because they had really no value. But to me, they sort of, they were so beautiful and, and had these shapes that this was like a, a treasure of my mother's. So somehow, I think the formation of these for me represents my mother. I put them in the studio, and then I also realized that they became kind of the community, or like a school of fish, um, or the crowd in a Greek chorus, or Shakespeare play, I mean the, the, the chorus. And at the same time I returned home, a friend of mine had recommended that I read the Shirley Jackson novel, We Have Always Lived in the Castle. And that was written in 1962, and that was the year I was born. So it was just this coincidence that I was reading this story, um, this novel, by Shirley Jackson at the same time that I had, was returning home. And I was staying in the bedroom where I grew up, and so I was having all kinds of um, conflicting feelings and intense feelings about returning, the, the trajectory of my life in general. Um, so what happens in the novel, too, is that there's a close relationship between the youngest uh, daughter, named Mary Cat, and her older sister. And she poisons the rest of her family. She puts poison in the sugar um, one, dinner, I, one day at dinner. I don't know if you know the story. But she, doesn't, she knows that her older sister, who she's really close to, won't take sugar on her blackberries and for dessert. So. Um, so it's the story of these two women who live out their lives, and they are ostracized by the community. The older sister is accused of the murder of the family, but she's acquitted, um, and she knows that the younger sister has, has done this. So I was having all of these thoughts, um, and I really loved the book. Um, so let's see, um, at the same time, I had for a long time wanted to make an Iron Maiden, a sculpture of an Iron Maiden. And sculpture is my primary medium, but I do a lot of different things as well. I had made a, in my studio, and Adrian is one of my students from MCA, and, and so she got to see this installation of when it first started, and I had made, uh, I wanted to make an Iron Maiden because I thought it was just an interesting um, form of torture from the Middle Ages. And I had seen a horror film when I was little where this woman is put in, this beautiful woman is put into an Iron Maiden and it just seemed horrific to me. And so this stayed with me for a long time. And, and I went for a hike in Shelby Farms and I saw these, this tree that has these incredible branches. And so I knew um, that I wanted to make the Iron Maiden with these branches. But I also wanted to make an Iron Maiden that you wouldn't be put into it would be an Iron Maiden, perhaps, that you put yourself into, like a psychological state. Um, so I made the Iron Maiden, which you saw originally, and then I didn't know I was going to get to do this show, so I reused the branches for other sculpture for a show that happened in Los Angeles last December. So when I was notified about this show, I had to go back to Shelby Farms and try to find um, this, these thorns in this tree, which was a journey in itself. Um, and I found this sort of one perfect branch, whereas before the Iron Maiden took on this shape, it was a lot of different branches, um, so I found this one perfect thing. So my thought was that um, it would be this, this sort of torture device that you would put yourself in, um, that no one puts it in you, 
puts you in it, but it's a thing that you do to yourself. And hopefully, just as easily, you can let yourself out. Uh, the sugar cubes are referenced from the book. And when I first did the installation, Eric met me at the door and he said, we can't have those sugar cubes um, in the space because they'll be ants. So fortunately, I had a friend who had some alabaster, and I carved them out of alabaster. The teacup is from my mother's house. Um, I also wanted to make two, um, two knots, um, a noose and a slip knot out of rope as a sculpture. Um, that would work together as a couple. Um, and so I was looking for rope, and I found this rope, but it just ended up being in a pile on my studio floor for a while. And I thought, eventually, that's, that's perfect. It doesn't need anything done to it. It doesn't need a knot. It became this sort of symbol of a brain unraveling or kind of a mess. Um, but still, the shape and the form of the rope seemed to work just in a jumbled pile like that. Uh, the soundtrack, I started recording, um, there's a, a friend in, that I have named Steve Roden, who's a wonderful artist, and he records sounds and puts them together. So I got a little um, stereo recorder that I could just slip in my pocket, and I started recording sounds, because I remember that there's certain sounds and smells from a place, and so the sounds from Memphis that I remember so well from growing up. One is the siren that goes off on Saturdays near my house. It's kind of terrifying, um, but it's the warning uh, sound signal that goes off. And then just other various sounds uh, that I think of when I think of home, when I think of Memphis, cicadas and heavy rain and sounds from my parents' house. So at the time I was working on this, I didn't, I didn't think that the soundtrack was for this installation, but I started doing them at the same time, and so they began to become interwoven in my mind, and they sort of needed each other. So I began to think of this installation uh, sort of like a set or a piece of theater, and I was hoping that the viewer and the people coming to see it would walk in and out of the pieces, and there would be small discoveries along the way. Um, and the music being a part of that, or the sounds being a part of that, like a soundtrack for this experience. Um, the chandeliers, too, are a sculpture that I, it's a form that I started to make over and over. I don't like to make anything more than once, but this is a sculpture that, for some reason, I keep making over and over. Um, and so, it's the form of a chandelier, but there's no real light. So it's sort of this unrealized potential in a symbol of light and illumination, um, yet it's, it's fragile and it doesn't really work. And those two um, chandeliers also, for me, started to become the sisters. They started to take on the personality of the two characters in the book. And also, for me, they started to take on the character of me and my brother, me and my son, the relationship between two people. Um, and so this one is more drawn to the rope, uh, and this one is staying aloof. The photograph is from the Cotton Museum. She's a mannequin that's uh, in one of their cabinets there. So she is just such a beautiful figure but also so odd. And so this was a real curious thing at the Cotton Museum. She, her face is uh, just blank. And so there was this perfect alcove here in the space. And so she fit perfectly there. And she's sort of like mirror, mirror on the wall. Um, the Cotton Queen, um, the sentimentality of past era. She's a very haunting mannequin for me. Um, and so, but I give credit to the Cop Museum because they have her in their, their case there. 